All right, thank you for joining us. My name is Rodney Dawson, Curator of Education at the Greensboro History Museum. And today's conversation is made possible in part by the Greensboro History Museum, the Greensboro Human Rights Department, the City of Greensboro as a whole, and the Libraries Department, uh, as well as Greensboro History Museum, Inc. Uh, any views, findings, or recommendations expressed in today's program do not necessarily reflect those aforementioned entities. And we're also extremely pleased to have our guest audience join us as you're coming in. And if you'll take the time to view the button, uh, the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A icon. By selecting this option, you can type in questions for our panelists. Uh, you can also utilize the chat. And once you've typed in your question, you can just hit the enter button on the keyboard to submit it. However, we have reserved the latter part of our program to field questions this evening. And we welcome our panelists for today's webinar, which will also be archived on our YouTube channel after 5.30 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, normally, we can make it available immediately, but It'll be available after 5.30 p.m. tomorrow. Just go on greensborohistory.org, look at the top of the page, you'll see the YouTube icon and just click it. And um, uh, it should take you to the, uh, the webinars and just, you know, you'll see this one or just type in from grassroots to government. Uh, tonight is the second installment of our From Grassroots to Government series. And it's entitled Reentry Support, Helping the Formerly Incarcerated by Capturing the Story of Why Reentry Work is Needed, How Commissions Have Supported Reentry Work, and outreach, how incarceration and criminal records affect our residents and communities, and the city's role in supporting reentry through the banning the box, the hiring, and Thrive GSO. And uh, we have a very, very talented, uh, and I would say a gift to the city of Greensboro. She runs the Human Rights Department, and if you got on early, you ex uh, she explained uh, they just changed the name back in, it was approved back in October. So tonight's moderator is none other than Dr. Love Jones. Um, the director and Thrive GSO co-founder. So uh, Dr. Jones, thank you for taking uh, time this evening and we appreciate your expertise and all your talents and skills being laid for everyone to see tonight. So thank you for joining us. Rodney, thank you so much for, for having me. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to support and facilitate a conversation about our service and our continued need to support re-entry or uh, justice served populations. And so um, again, thank you so very much. Also thank you to the Greensboro History Museum as a whole for being committed to these kinds of series, creating a bridge between us and the community by way of conversation. So again, thank you. First and foremost, I want to introduce our incredible panel um, of contributors on tonight. Um, first, I wanna start with Irving Allen who is also a co-founder of the initiative Thrive GSO. Um, I also want to acknowledge that he is one of the most well-known grassroots organizers in the community. Um, Irving has a long history of addressing social justice and equity challenges in Greensboro and beyond. Um, his work stems beyond the state of North Carolina by way of his professional commitment to social justice through the organizations that he served in, but also from a grassroots perspective, he has always been on the front line to address the needs, concerns, and issues that face those most marginalized in Greensboro. So Irving, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Next, I would like to acknowledge F.J. Carney, who began in law, his career in law enforcement with the Greensboro Police Department in the mid-1990s, actually. Um, since this time, he served in various positions in federal law enforcement, and currently he is with the U.S. Probation Office. Um, with the Middle District of North Carolina here in Greensboro. So FJ, I would like to thank you as well for uh, your participation on the panel this evening. Finally, I want to acknowledge Victor Vincent. Victor is, is known as the re-entry expert. He has spent 11 years in Greensboro helping the judicially experienced to become successful members of the community. And again, Victor, thank you for being here as well. I have had the pleasure of working with all three panelists up close and personal as we have worked to address these challenges that are faced by our reentry or justice served populations. 
Um, I want to provide just a brief description of what Thrive GSO is about, how it came to be, and then we're going to engage in the most important part, which is having a conversation and creating a dialogue amongst our three panelists. So Thrive GSO was really birthed out of a grassroots effort um, that was led by Irving Allen. He was in the business of having expungement clinics at, as often as possible, which wasn't very often due to resources, but as often as possible, having people in the community have a place, a hub where they could get information, have their records reviewed, hopefully expunged depending upon the, the manner of charges that they may have acquired along the way. And it just so happened that one day he invited me to a clinic. He said, come by on Saturday. Um, we're gonna hold a, a, a clinic at, um, at uh, Faith Community. And he said, you know, what you need to do is just really see in action how these clinics work and how committed people are to helping. So I get there and it's like midday, moving towards the afternoon. And he says, well, it's pretty, be as you can see, it's pretty busy around here now, but you should have seen it earlier. And I said, what do you mean? He said, people were wrapped around the building. And I was like, wow. I said, well, you know, I'm not surprised because the need is so great, but it's wonderful that you were able to have a turnout like that for something that doesn't get to happen. But so often his response to me was, but it should happen more often. And, you know, we need the resources here. And the challenge at the time was that out of uh, our state's capital, there were initiatives um, that were led by the Social Justice Coalition and some other entities where as often as possible, these clinics would be in pop-up fashion across the state. You can imagine with the number of counties we have that it was more like waiting on, you know, a big event, like waiting on the state fair um, to come around as far as your, your particular community. So what became more intriguing was that I was having a conversation with our former city attorney, Tom Carruthers, telling him about this incredible event that I'd attended and how important I thought it would be for our community to be able to host something like that more often. And at the time, um, Tom Carruthers looks at me and he says, well, you know, the Greensboro Bar Association has just taken on a partnership with the Second Chance Initiative, but we don't have any clients. We can't find any clients. And I said, well, they were over there on Saturday wrapped around the building. And that was really the birth of us having more conversation about how to make these clinics happen more often. Well, as life would have it, the more we learned about our state's legal parameters around removing items from a criminal record, we learned that a lot of people really weren't going to get the results that they hoped for because of how long the statutes were in order to remove certain items from one's record. And so that's how Thrive GSO came to be, because we said, you know what, people need a sense of hope no matter what. If they can get things off their record, that's great. But if not, how do we pull the resources more closely to the, the needs of those who are navigating reentry experience? How do we build a bridge so that when it comes to the things that you need to thrive in this city, you can have full access? And so as it turned out, we were able to develop Thrive GSO based on a model of creating information hubs around four topics, voting, education, employment, and housing. And from that, we began to find experts in the community who were able to talk about how does one gain housing access, even if they do have a record and can't get everything expunged. What are the actual laws around voting eligibility for people who have certain items on their criminal record? What are the myths that we need to debunk? So the beauty of Thrive GSO has always been that it's not a service provision so much as it is an information hub. We've got plenty of people across the city doing the work to help justice serve populations, but we don't have a centralized place where people can get that information with having to, without having to sort through 
all of the different agencies to see where they're most eligible to receive services. So the benefit of Thrive GSO is that the city does the work of vetting all of those who have contributed to the information hub in order to ensure that when people need support, they can make a beeline for the agency or for the entity that's gonna provide the best service. And that's why I'm really excited on tonight to talk more about ways in which our community can eliminate um, and eradicate barriers for those who are simply in need of a second chance. And so to have this panel of people tonight who have all contributed to Thrive GSO heavily in one way or another is really a delight for me because it looks like, you know, the opportunity for this conversation to come full circle for the community to have a better understanding of the work that different partners have been doing with Thrive GSO. And so with that being said, I really want to start out by um, asking you, Irvin, about just your initial instincts about why this work was important. You were responsible for organizing the Clean Slate program. And you know, I'm interested in, and I think the community should be interested in what led up to that event. And in your opinion, why is it so important that the city organization support reentry efforts? Absolutely. Well, well thank you so much for that, that introduction uh, and for uh, running us down memory lane of, of the expungement clinic. It was. It was definitely a, a, a great experience um, and, and really a turning point for uh, a lot of reentry work in the city. Um, and, and really, it uh, is it's something that had reappeared for me time and time again. Uh, several of my close friends have been incarcerated, have, have dealt with being through the system. Uh, and in, in all honesty, it was a selfish thought of how can I help all of these folks that I know personally uh, get in better situations. Um, and some of the first people that, that actually went through the program uh, and got some of the expungements when we first uh, were able to start performing them within Guilford County uh, were some of my personal friends who, who needed uh, that relief for, for housing access, for access to school, uh, for, for just uh, access to extra resources to live, to know uh, their, their rights around voting. And, and those uh, key components are so connected to, to every facet of, of being successful and being able to thrive uh, in Greensboro. And so I think uh, it, it was, it was uh, something that, that was really natural uh, and something that, that uh, we were looking to help. Uh, and when I ran across uh, the uh, Southern Coalition for Social Justice and the program that they were working with, uh, with, with Umar at the time, uh, who really introduced me to the program and drove down here from Durham uh, to, to help me organize the, the event that we put together. Uh, so so uh, a lot of credit go, goes to him uh, and to Spirit House in Durham, who, who was really uh, baseline in that work. And I, uh, <laughs> I went to Durham for about a month <laughs> to really just learn uh, the tactics that they were using to build community in their neighborhoods and to, to reach uh, and to fill those gaps that, that we were seeing because Greensboro is, is really a resource rich community uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, just other, uh, in comparison to other communities. Uh, and so it's really just about being able to fill those gaps uh, and connect people with the information and the resources that, that are already available. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes also uh, turn the steering wheels of, of the uh, institutions and organizations in the direction of, of those communities and, and people that that need those resources the most and i think you know uh, thrive was a perfect example of how we were able to successfully do that uh and and so i yeah i'm just something I'm, I'm excited about today and i think that you know the resources uh really make a difference no matter what you're looking at when uh the big issues of the day around voter suppression uh, one of the main uh, folks that uh, get suppressed and, and the misinformation that goes around uh, folks who were uh, formerly incarcerated is uh, around voting and, and, and how their access is restricted or, or not restricted. Um, and you, you talk about, uh, you know, access to, to uh, education, uh, to, to uh, being able to provide a livelihood for yourself and your family uh, and and all of these uh, 
symptoms that we see manifesting in our communities, uh, be it the, the intercommunity violence or uh, the poverty, the homelessness, uh, and, and, and uh, things that we see are, are all connected to how we're helping each other to connect to the things that we need. I think you're muted, love, sorry. I'm certainly muted, thank you. Um, I wanna loop back around to uh, the question of why it from your perspective as a grassroots organizer, is it critical for city organizations or municipalities to be a part of efforts like this? Yeah, well, I think that there are so many grassroots organizations and, and individuals, impacted individuals that are carrying on this work, passing on the information, um, but to institutionalize it and to be able to use the resources of, of the city was a game changer. As you saw, uh, as you spoke about earlier with the program from uh, Southern Coalition for Social Justice, uh, going uh, responsible for the entire state and we had we served maybe over 300 people that day just here in Greensboro that uh, you know were lined around the building and were willing to leave their information and to you know discuss you know probably some of the worst moments of their lives in in public settings just to get that relief. Uh, so you can imagine how they felt and when they heard that we were trying to start a program. Uh, within the city to serve the citizens of Guilford County, they were excited because they were relieved that that you know they could uh, work with us and take and kind of take Guilford County off of their schedule to be able to serve some of the other places because we were taking a proactive role in being able to serve citizens and to provide that much needed service. So not only does it provide relief for the individuals, but also the service providers and the system. Uh, when when the city can come in and take some of that responsibility and some of the onus off of their shoulders uh, to 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 provide these services that are are needed clearly uh, on a daily basis and we talk about you know the school to prison pipeline and all of uh, the uh, I guess things that we're being educated about uh, the criminal justice system and how it you know ran rampant uh, so this is a, a direct and proactive way of, of reversing some of the, the harms that we've, we've done through that system uh, by investing our resources and our time and our energies into uh, serving these populations and, and taking care of, of those resources. Thank you, thank you, Irving. Um, and I think that what you said, you, you touched on the fact that people are willing to be vulnerable and share some of the most complex sometimes most humiliating, sometimes most sorrowful moments in their lives um, to a perfect stranger just to get the support and help that you need. And many times um, those helping may or may not have had firsthand experience and may not be in touch with some of those vulnerabilities. And that makes me wanna turn to uh, Victor v Vincent. Victor, if you could talk about or expound on a little bit about your personal story and why this topic is at all important to you, kind of what led you to become the re-entry expert? Yes, um, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. And it's funny because most people link Baltimore to the HBO special, The Wire. <clears throat> That's kind of exactly how I grew up. You know, it was funny because I'm at an intricate part of my life where I'm reflecting and the George Floyd trial really has me reflecting to my youth because I was in a George Floyd type situation. The only difference is I fought my way out of it. And instead of getting killed or beating, I ended up with a 10 year prison sentence. I learned how to be a monster in prison. I was taught to be a monster in prison. The police wanted to break me, so they put me in a dormitory with a bunch of guys from East Baltimore, and I was from West Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, but I had this resilience, this gift of making it through tough situations. And I made it through that situation, and I learned to take that monster with me out into the streets. Now, I come home after doing this time, 
And the only thing that seemed available to me that was right in front of me was dudes wanting to bring me into the game because of my reputation um, for, for fighting the police and my size. Um, so I learned a lot of ugly stuff in the prison system. And this has taken years to get rid of that monster. And I've turned that monster into a passion and a driving passion to help people like me. Because one of the things that I realized coming home was me doing it wasn't going to get me to where I needed to be. I needed some help. The good thing about me is I had that mindset of contacting the people who held the power, the people in government, to give me some help to stop going back and forth to prison. And I was blessed because the mayor of Baltimore at the time, who was Kurt Smoke, gave me some help to help me straighten my life out. So I had family, I had the mayor, and I was able to get into programs to help me develop the skills that I didn't have because I dropped out of school in the seventh grade. Um, there was no job for me because I'm a two-time convicted felon. Nobody wanted to hire me. But I realized after doing the programming, I had to be the mouthpiece, the spokesman for myself. I had to be able to get in the rooms with people and talk to people and show people like, hey, I'm not that monster um, that I was 5, 10, 15 years ago. And I was blessed with the opportunity to get in these rooms, have these conversations with people. And people say, you know what, Vic? I really like you. You seem like the kind of guy that would be nice to go out and have a beer with, have a drink with. So when I was given the opportunity to get into the workforce, I go in and give it all I have. The same monster that was in those streets is the same monster in the workforce. And if you ever ask anybody who works with me, they will tell you like, yo, get out of his way or move to his feet because he gonna roll you over. Because I feel like it's a blessing to get the opportunity because at the same time I realize so many of us don't get it. A lot of us don't have that support system. A lot of us don't have that help. A lot of us don't have that intelligence. A lot of us don't have that family. And it's a lot of people who would love to turn their lives around, but they just don't have the support to do it. And that's why I became the re-entry expert. I'm that support. I'm that dude that was in the streets. I'm that dude that walked the yard. So you can't get over on me. Um, you can't fool me. You can't trick me. But if you're willing to work and give it all you have to turn your life around, I'm willing to get in there and work with you step for step, day by day, day and night, just to help people like myself turn their lives around. Thank you, Victor. I want to uh, quickly follow up because you said something really compelling. You said, you know, that you had to channel all of the things that you would learned um, as a part of navigating the system, you had to channel that into passion. Can you talk a little bit about how important it is for someone to recognize that passion and support you in it, um, as opposed to uh, treating you in manners that are more stereotypical of how people think they need to navigate with those who are just deserved? Uh, Ms. Jones, that is so difficult. Um, what are things that I realized, no matter how you look at it, um, people have a hard time relating slavery to Jim Crow to the prison population, to mass incarceration. No matter what you say to people, some people can't make that connection. They can't link it together. It's always he did some, it's his fault. He shouldn't have done that. It shouldn't have happened to him. And people don't realize that sometimes you could be in the wrong place at the wrong time and end up in a bad situation. Sometimes you could be around a bad situation and just gently fall into it. I always said that there were no jobs in my neighborhood. So we always had to go out the neighborhood to find employment, but there was always that drug trade right there on the block that was sitting there waiting for you every time you walked out the door. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I had to learn was to see that the devastation and destruction of that drug trade. See, because it's a false image like, you know, this thing good. You can get some fast money, you can get some money, and you can make it. Um, 
but most people can't see the identity behind where that lifestyle is going to take you. When I used to look back for positive role models, there were none. But I realized after I got my life together, the reason why there were no positive role models in the hood was because once people got successful, they moved on. They were afraid that they would be victims of that culture and get caught up in that culture. So when people got successful, they moved away from the hood to better locations. I think what you mentioned is very much the systemic elements of how navigating post-incarceration, um, how, how systemic the challenges can be. Because on the one hand, you may very well be in the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps subject to a discriminatory act, um, perhaps actually making a poor decision, any of those three but how you end up there and then what you have to do to navigate through the experience and then try to reintroduce yourself um, as a person who is a viable employee, a person who is eligible to um, further their education, a person who should be able to make you know, judgment calls as a voter, you know, a person who does deserve to live in safe, fair and affordable shelter it's almost like you have to audition for all of those things all the time and how mentally fatiguing and systemically fatiguing that must be. So it's really critical for people like yourself who have lived it and navigated it to educate those of us who may not have navigated it firsthand because you can come up with all of the ingredients of what's gonna make a workable solution but if you've never had to navigate it from the perspective of the one looking for the solutions, then you really may lack understanding and therefore the breadth and depth of compassion that's necessary to really help people. And that makes me wanna shift gears to FJ um, because FJ has worked with our office for quite some time now. And he has shared some really compelling experiences of how his compassion and how his commitment um, is, is of the utmost importance when it comes to helping people who are navigating as a member of the justice served populations in our city. And so, FJ, first I just want to ask, you know, you've helped a number of judicially experienced residents in your role. And, you know, you've served as a probation and a parole officer. Can you tell us first about your role? Because some people actually don't understand the work of a probation or parole officer. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to do that because I think you're exactly right. And I apologize in advance because I have a ton of notes that I've taken just from the first two people speaking. Um, and I just want to get it all out. Um, but I think it, I, I like to look at US probation holistically from 30,000 feet um, because we live in a very gray world, um, my organization. Um, you know, not only just the way I look, but also the way I carry myself in my job, what I do as a probation officer, most people automatically assume, oh, he's a cop. But I think what I want you to know is I'm a lot of different things, as is everybody on the hall here. Um, I like to think of myself as a cop, a coach, a teacher, a farmer planting seeds that might or might not grow. Somebody mentioned navigation. I think of the high seas. Sometimes, you know, if you can just change a rudder on a ship just a little bit, it's going to change the course of, of that, that person or that, you know, that, that situation. Um, but I work for the judicial branch of the government. I'm, uh, the Middle District is one of 94 districts throughout the country. We are a national system, um, but I am the Middle District of North Carolina. North Carolina has three, Middle, Western, and Eastern. Um, territorially, I cover roughly Virginia, to Virginia, to South Carolina, east to Durham, and west to Winston. But we do have other offices spread out through that area, so we break it up. Most of my time is personally spent in, in the Greensboro High Point area, mm -hmm. um, but I do make it over to Alamance County, Orange County, up towards Rockingham. Um, statutorily, by law, um, my job is to protect the public but equally as important, because I don't want to say one and two or A and B, I think it's one and one A, equally important is to give people the opportunity to make those changes in their life 
so they don't go back. Um, in many people, uh, many people that have not been exposed to the justice system or quote unquote US probation, they say, oh, here's a list of rules. If you break them, you're going back to prison. It's not that simple. I want the public to know that, yes, there is certainly an enforcement side. The court gives people rules as a part of their judgment. The ter I, I say term of supervision, which most people know as probation. Um, there are some subtle differences between that and parole, et cetera. But most people coming out are serving a term of supervision, and it is part of their judgment. Um, but it is designed to help them reenter as opposed to, and, and I'm in sales a little bit in relationship business, but it's, it's, it's a tough sell in the beginning because they feel like it's just an extension of the punishment. But as I said, I wear a lot of different hats. Um, to touch on something you mentioned and we've talked about before, what I love about the city, city of Greensboro's involvement in Thrive is it does provide that hub because I've been to a lot of meetings and everybody, there's a lot of people out there saying they're gonna do different things, this and that. But I love the fact that I can pick up the phone, speak to you or Jody or anybody in your office. If I have a question about something typically for a client and I can, and I can get that information and run with it. It's just, it's just more connections because this job is too big for one person. Um, but so I also would like to say, and I don't wanna steal everybody's time, but so yeah, you do have a long list of rules and regulations that you do need to follow, but we are assessing people as they come in to keep it simple, high, medium and low risk. Um, and we are trying to put our efforts where the research tells us to go, the people with the higher risk and maybe a higher chance of violence, we are putting our efforts into that, meeting them and uh, giving them resources. But the biggest and most important thing we do is we focus on the, uh, the individual and we try to change their thinking. The belief is thinking drives your behavior. This is where I put my teaching hat on. We work on cog cognition models or thinking models. If somebody is doing something good, we are gonna reinforce that. If they are doing something bad, we might simply have a conversation about it and, and look for an alternative. Um, so there's a lot of things behind the scenes that we do to individualize it, to help the people, but it really boils down to decisions. And one thing that I have certainly learned in this position is the justice system cannot force a person to be free. Some people, unfortunately, do just have a habit of making decisions. They don't want to use the resources or get the help. That's what I love so much about Vic is because he hit on it. And I think, Vic, I think I'm quoting you correctly. They're willing to work and it is hard. Reentry is very, very hard. And, you know, for me as a probation officer, and I'm not from Greensboro, but I was raised in Greensboro from when I was about two. And look, I, I'm the product of white privilege. I am the product of an upper middle class family. And I have um, been able to have experiences that many don't. And what I have come to realize in this job is there is a very, very fine line between a justice served individual and people like me. Um, as Vic, I think also said, it is not always bad people doing bad things. Sometimes it is good people making really poor decisions. And it's amazing to me, and I get into this when I talk about thinking models, is if some people just had one, two, maybe three seconds to slow it down and make a better decision, it could have changed their life completely. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question, but U.S. probation, we're very research-based. Yes, we are the police, but we are also a lot of other things, and we are trying to help these people navigate the system and encourage them and model for them um, the behaviors that are expected to reenter successfully. You mentioned something, FJ, that I want to loop back around to as well. You talked about the distinction between being white, middle class, and privileged, and how um, there's a very fine line. And I can say from working in higher education for a long time, not only as an academic, but also in um, our uh, housing and residence life realm that, you know, young people come in from different places. Sometimes two young people can make the same poor decision, but depending upon where class intersects, 
that determines what kind of consequences they have to navigate. And so what I wanna ask you kind of a spinoff question is, um, what have you observed as the difference between families and, and opportunities of people who may have made a poor decision and they do have consequences, but how they navigate those consequences in comparison to a person who doesn't come from any privilege at all or, or very little uh, privilege? I, I apologize, but are you asking me how that happens or how they navigate it? How they navigate it, like what is the difference when you are the probation or parole officer for a person who has some element of privilege socioeconomically, some element of privilege um, as far as educational opportunity versus the person who doesn't have any of those things. Right. How does that look a little different? Well, I, I'm hoping I'm going to answer your question in the, in the right way. The, I guess, Another thing that I've learned in my experiences is I don't, I don't try to put what I would deem as my level of success mm. onto somebody else. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes in and they don't have the high school diploma or GED, I'm going to work with them to try to motivate them and help them get that GED mm -hmm. and show them the value in that GED uh, or high school diploma. Um, Again, the, the supervision is so individualized, it, it just, okay. it's really hard. But the truth is people that are just as served and they spend time together in prison and or the halfway house coming into Greensboro. And it's very hard in today's society not to compare yourself to the Joneses, mm -hmm. right? And, and so one person I'm supervising might know another person I'm supervising and know I'm supervising them in different ways, but it's based on individualized circumstances, which I'm not going to share with the two different individuals. Um, you know, and if I can uh, regress a little bit, because I think Irving brought it up, the uh, pipeline to prison or prison question, school to prison pipeline. Apologize. I, my wife is in education at a, um, a pretty diverse school. And it's really interesting because, um, you, you know, I, I, I hear the stories that she comes home with and you can see certain things developing at a very young age, um, which isn't necessarily the kid's fault. And that's the sad part. You go all the way back there and you were put in some situations. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's been enlightening to me. And if I may also, I'm kind of going to expand a little bit. Um, uh, like I said, I started with GPD straight out of college. And it was, this has been a very interesting, not only personal, but professional evolution for me because literally for the first half of my professional career, I was on the investigative side. You had a crime, found a suspect, arrested the suspect, go to court, clean your hands of it. And the interesting thing about the job I'm in now, now people are serving a term of supervision. It could be three, five years, it could be life. And now you really have an opportunity to sit down and get to know that person one-on-one -on -one and you start to figure out, oh, this is part of the reason that led you down the path to, to prison. And uh, it, it's personally, it's been really pretty cool um, to see that. And that's where I come up with that fine line between me and, and the people I serve. Um, you know, but, but again, there's a lot of people out there, they don't want to take the help and they want to do it their way. And that's where, unfortunately, I, I supervise a high-risk caseload. So statistically, you know, and I'm totally making this number up, say 80%, there, there's an 80% recidivism rate with my caseload. Well, I'm trying to look at the glass half full and say, well, why can't this person be the 20%? Um, but it is, it's a very difficult job. It's mentally exhausting. Um, but I mean, I can't imagine what it's like to be the person on the other side, because like you said, it's very tiring. And, and the little things, um, the, the getting the driver's license, the, the, the you know, having an order for your arrest because you missed court, but you were locked up in federal prison. And that's why you missed it. It's those little things that have a tendency of piling up and become big things. So I try to help, you know, navigate as much as possible on that. Did, did that answer your question? I know I said a lot. Hey, Miss. Absolutely. <laughs> Hey, Ms. Jones, could I piggyback off of that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, FJ selling himself short 
because I've worked with him and I've been with a lot of parole and probation officers and I've been violated every time I was on it. And I have never seen a probation officer go out for clients like he does. Um, we've met clients for lunch. He's brought clients on the job, sat in my office and we talk. Um, so he's great at what he does. And I hope all of North Carolina is like that when it comes to parole and probation. The second thing I wanna say is, I want everybody to realize one thing. I was a seventh grade dropout. I was a dope fiend. I was a stick up boy and I was a gangster because my neighborhood um, allowed me to be the best hood dude I could be. Um, when I started turning my life around, it's because the mayor reached out, after I reached out to the mayor, he reached back. And I was like, wow, somebody cares about me. So after that time, I got my GED. I have a bachelor's degree with uh, Guilford College in criminal justice. And I was the president of the student government body at Guilford College. And it's funny how every step of that way, it was one person or another encouraging me to move forward, to push forward. I never could understand, and my mother lasts about it to this day. You couldn't keep me in school in the seventh grade, but I love college. Um, I excelled on that campus. Um, so it's amazing how with the right support system and the right people with you, how much you can do and how far you can go. Well, and if I, may, if I may inject, thank you for those kind words, Victor, yeah. but it goes both ways because without Victor, um, you know, I would not have a person to meet and take these people to. He's always very giving with his time. Um, he, I know he, for a fact he spent money out of his po own pocket to provide certain things for clients of mine. So thank you, Vic. Well, what I hope the people observing this webinar see is this three-pronged approach that really contributes to the success. We have a person who provides a direct service while people are in transition by way of a federal or state mandate, um, and that's FJ who is familiar with the, the particular things that must evolve over time in order for a person to have a shot at being successful beyond their just deserved experience. But then you have Victor, who is the up close and personal trusted party because of having navigated it. And that is another critical prong. And then you have Irving, who has this laser focus on the way in which the judicial system manifests itself in real life and creates either opportunities or barriers. And his work as a grassroots organizer brings services close to the doorstep of people who need it most. And so when you think about from a community perspective, what is it that is going to help people in Greensboro really be able to move forward past any sort of challenges they've had with our criminal justice system, this is it. This is the three-prong approach. Now, if I were to go a step further and say that once you bring municipalities into the equation to learn and determine how they can play a role by way of offices like human rights, then you really have a healthy mix of what it takes for people to see the kind of progress and evolution that they wanna see for their own lives, not what, the, what those outside of their experience want to see in them, but what people believe is possible for themselves. It takes this kind of systemic work. Many times, um, I think I was, it was just a couple of weeks ago, I was saying that we have plenty of conversations about systemic problems, but we also have to take the leap and start generating systemic solutions. We can't have one for one solutions because in the end, the challenges, the barriers are systemic in nature. So um, this hopefully has been a healthy demonstration of how all of these pieces and parts can work together in order to create the kind of Greensboro, Greensboro where a person who needs a second chance really can thrive. Dr. Yeah. Jones, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just letting everyone know we're approaching the uh, 650 mark. Uh, so the I uh, encourage our, our viewers to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, there's a question there now, but go ahead and continue to just write your questions in the Q&A so we can address them in a few moments. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Carney, I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. It actually, it's a perfect segue because I wanted you to flash up because I would I would suggest there's actually a fourth prong love and it's something that, that Rodney is doing because I thought about it um, after, <laughs> those of you don't know, we did a 
technological check yesterday. And uh, little did uh, Rodney know that Vic and I are talkers. So what was probably supposed to be five or 10 minutes ended up being about 40 minutes. <laughs> but uh, all that being said is he mentioned something to me yesterday about talking about using kind of what we're talking about today to possibly make lesson plans. Is that, did, did I understand it correctly? Right. And for, for the youth. And I see that, I mean, with all the different issues that are going on, um, and we know about the, the school to prison pipeline, it would be really cool to, to um, teach things like thinking models to kids. I mean, I understand school is about problem solving and, you know, skill building and, and working together and all that, but to take it to another level and actually get into these thinking models of, hey, here's a situation, it's out of your control and it's very stressful. What are those thoughts? And then running through that process because it very well might help on the, the other end, the adult end where I'm at and what I see because it's amazing with the assessments that we do and the, the things that come to surface um, saying, hey, these are your risk factors. And then when we know what we're looking for, it's pretty easy to find in their statements and their behaviors. So we're constantly trying to fix it. So if, if we could fix it at a younger age, maybe we don't have quite as many problems as we do now. And, and if I can jump in and, and you, you, when I used to teach, I was what they call a CPI instructor, crisis prevention intervention. And a, a lot of people thought that course was teaching you nonviolent restraints, but 80% of the course was teaching you how to build relationships. And uh, so I dealt with uh, quite a few kids that, um, we're in and out of ISS, in school suspension, or out of school suspension, or even expulsion. And I used to tell them, I'm not a big guy, you know, I said, but I used to tell them, I said, right now you're in elementary school and you're in middle school and they're calling me because you haven't learned how to cope with different problems or critically think your way through it. And so you're acting out. I said, but the older you get, the less cute it becomes. And they stop calling me. They start calling people with uniforms on and then you're making lifelong decisions or uh, decisions that will affect your life. And so, uh, which brings me to the point of why I think if you can have opportunities that teach critical thinking, uh, the stress, uh, you know, being hesitant and uh, assessing a situation before you make a decision uh, with the mindset that your future or your reputation, uh, but you're shaping your decision-making at a young age in those formative years that will bear out uh, for a better uh, future later on in life. One of the things I think is really interesting about this conversation, and I'm glad it's going in the direction that it's going, is because a lot of times when people are, sometimes people shy away from conversations about justice served needs because they feel like it's such a large challenge. They don't know how to help, if they should help, when is the perfect time to intervene in order to be preventive or what have you. And what I like about the way that uh, Thrive as an initiative has gotten off the ground. And what I've been able to learn um, as a human rights worker is that intervention can happen all the time. Support can happen all the time. It is ideal to be preventive and make sure that young people have a lens through which to see that there are multiple options for problem solving. And what I like about Thrive is that it works to do that. The, the goal is to do some preventive work, but also it's a resource available for people who need support in a reactionary mode as well, right? Because if you're 25 or 45, or in some instances 65, like some of the people that we get to help, um, they're a part of the populations where people have said it's too late. You know, whatever your fate is and life is what it is, you made the mistakes and therefore this is your, your life fate, but life's fate. But what I like about the work that happens with the people who are on this call is that it's not too late for anyone. That for as much as the preventive work can happen, should happen, and we should have as many systemic mechanisms available to get in there and do that preventive work, that if you get to a place where you're in life and you weren't able to be a part of the preventive mechanism, right, you weren't able to be, you know, reeled in or, 
or brought into the fold before you made poor decisions, that there is still a place, a softer place for you to land. It might not be as soft as the preventive place where you can be unscathed, but it's softer than being left out dangling in the cold of whatever blows life has to offer because you made a mistake. Absolutely. So I really appreciate the work of everyone on this call because it also manages across generations the way in which solutions can be applied to make sure that people can have a second chance wherever they find themselves and 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 whatever age or or whatever place and space they may be. Um, with that being said, I definitely want to um, thank every person who is participating on this evening. You three have been a lifeline even beyond this moment in this webinar, but you've been there for the work for as long as Thrive has been off the ground, and I'm very grateful. I'm extremely grateful to Rodney and the Historical Museum for thinking that these kinds of conversations deserve a platform through and by um, the efforts and, and this initiative with the Greensboro History Museum. So that's exciting. And I think it speaks to the way that we can broaden the work. Um, but now I know that we're moving into the hour where we do have some questions that are coming in and I wanna, I want to acknowledge um, those questions as they've come in. Okay, I, I do have one this is uh, for uh, Mr. Carney. Uh, how has the release of individuals from prison and jails because of COVID-19 affected your job, if at all? You see the bags under my eyes. <laughs> they, uh, they have local jails, federal prisons, um, they are certainly going back and looking at uh, particularly high risk individuals, people maybe with pre-existing conditions, um, compassion releases, as well as just early releases. Um, our workload has increased significantly. Um, and it was that, that first, it was a year ago, almost today, when this disease hit, um, I remember we, we started to adjust a little bit about how we worked, not only here at the probation office, but also up the street at the courthouse. Um, it, 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 our, our workload has increased significantly. Um, and I, we're doing the same thing, we're just doing it more. Um, and I, I, there's some good coming from it because, I mean, I think some people may, might deserve to get out a little bit early. Um, and COVID has forced the hand of the Bureau of Prisons. Um, however, there are certainly others that are taking advantage of it. We, we are extremely busy to say the least. Okay, thank you for that. This next one's for uh, Mr. Allen or, or Mr. Vincent. We, you talked about the, form, the challenges that are faced by formerly incarcerated you know, with employment and housing. Um, how are these problems exacerbated uh, if you, look at mental health issues or even addictions that were never addressed before or even while they were incarcerated. Uh, how have you handled this um, as, you, as you've come across it? Um, if I'll go first. Um, one of the things that I do is I take a one-on-one -on -one approach with clients. I deal with each client individually. Um, one of the things that I do is get to know the client as best as possible um, because one of the things that I focus on um, and my method is helping people chase their dreams. I have to figure out what my clients really love to do because anything beyond it is just wasting their time to me. And once I get you hooked on what you love to do and set you on a path for what you love to do, you tend to stay on that path and everything else tends to fall to the wayside. When you can find somebody that's, um, say for instance, a, a gang member, and when you get that person situated doing what they love to do, they don't have time for those dudes in the streets. Um, one of the things about dealing with people with addictions is that um, I go to NA meetings and I have mentees that have faced addiction. I go to all of their anniversaries so I can take a client to an anniversary. I can take a client who use and take them to a room where people who used to use and have him fellowship and talk with them and work on getting his life back together. Um, due to Thrive, we also partner with um, FIT which is right there off of uh, Cell Farm Eugene to, to take clients in to deal with Eugene Wilson, who had been a issue. Um, Thrive has put me 
and with a number of different organizations and programs. Because at the end of the day, it's not about me running an individual program. It's about people getting the help that they need. All right. Thank you, sir. And this is to, um, oh, go ahead. Can I add a little I'm bit? Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, off of what uh, Victor was saying, because I think it's so important to keep in mind uh, the, the end goal. And when we're talking about being successful, we're talking about um, being able to have the resources, the opportunity and the exposure to be able to, uh, to reach your goals. And I think that's what we need to keep in mind, whether we're talking about um, education, whether we're talking about uh, returning citizens or anything, the most successful communities, the most successful people are those that are surrounded by resources and access. And I think that that's the goal of, of Thrive and what we're trying to do is to build that hub to make it easier for folks to be able to, to access those resources, uh, to get the help and the assistance that they need, and to really uh, put into practice the community that uh, that we often talk about building. Uh, I know we do here in Greensboro about uh, how to we want to build community. And I think this is the the actual uh, actualization of, of that process and reaching out to those who uh, most need those resources and making sure that they're uh, being uplifted, um, not only with uh, physical resources, but also with uh, the access that they need to mental health resources, to um, uh, educational resources and things of that nature to be able to actually uh, put the stepping stones in front of them for a path, uh, for a different path. Uh, because a lot of, of, of the pave, uh, of the, the sidewalks that, that we have now uh, aren't, aren't necessarily paved with the best resources. And so I think that, uh, you know, uh, Vic spoke about the community that he came from and what was available to him. And so providing that exposure and those resources to people to show them a different way uh, is crucial for them uh, to make those better decisions that we talk about. Uh, and I also think it's important for us uh, to, to lean on the institutions that, that, that we're a part of to make sure that those things are happening uh, so that they don't end up just being some sort of, of, of work mill, uh, but that we're actually building those resources and relationships like FJ uh, talked about uh, with the people that we're serving. Uh, because I, I know from personal experiences, folks uh, who, who have uh, looked at uh, their uh, probation officers as, as burdens, uh, and they've been that because that's how they've been looked at. But uh, they can, I know also people who have used them as resources mm -hmm. to be able to, to step up. And so I think uh, it's just about the energy that you put into those situations as to what you'll get out of it. Um, and I think that that energy comes from both ends, not only the individual that's being served, but also the places that are served. Right, if, if I may also, I just, the probation officer or office, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars we probably spend on contracted mental health and substance use providers. It's an integral part of what we do and it's unfortunate, but substance use and mental health is a very, very big component of, of our, of the many risk factors that we deal with day in and day out. All right. And I'm, I'm going to try to get to two more questions before we have to close out, but one uh, to Dr. Jones, um, how challenging, and it could be the audio, but Dr. Jones, I'm going to head it towards you. How challenging has it been to uh, get resources every year uh, from your department? What I'm grateful for is that we have developed momentum such that um, there was a time when it felt like we were starting over at the drawing board each year with trying to uh, gain a good handful of agencies or entities that um, we're capable of helping. But probably after year one, we developed some traction because we kept the group engaged and we tried to stay in communication with service providers. And so now we actually have an extensive catalog of people who provide resources across all four of those areas. Where we are most challenged, however, is by way of housing provision. Um, trying to sustain housing providers who will commit to renting or providing access to those who have certain items on their um, records has proven to be somewhat challenging. It is not impossible. And we have had um, some, some ground 
that we've been able to make, but it is about a community mindset shift as much as it is about any of the resource gathering that you hear about on this call. It's about people getting educated about what it means to give an opportunity to a person who has been just disturbed and understand that the, the risk calculation is different for different individuals, which is why it's important to have those individual conversations as housing providers, instead of having a lump sum zero tolerance for particular items on one's record. Um, we've had several programs about how important it is for housing providers, especially um, those individualized landlords that are not so much connected to um, management companies who have that discretion, have the ability to get to know people on a more up close and personal basis to really do so, um, so that we can have a larger pool of resources when it comes to housing. Thank you for that. And I'm gonna make this the last one. Um, April is second chance month. Is there an action you would ask the community to do this month? This is for anyone. Uh, is there an action that you would ask the community to do this month to support your work and just to serve individuals? I'll keep it simple so that more, more than one of us can answer. Educate yourself about the needs and the experiences of just deserved populations in order to debunk myths and stereotypes. Mr. Vincent. Um, I'm doing something on my Facebook. I'm putting a, a different person on Facebook every day who has faced incarceration, but has made great contributions to society. And it's funny because an argument started because I posted Nelson Mandela. And somebody said, that's not fair. He was locked up for something he didn't do. And I was like, wow, you just missed the whole point. You just really missed the whole point. So I'm trying to educate people that everybody who has faced incarceration, number one, is not guilty. And number two, is not a monster. Mr. Carn. I would only add, you know, make an effort to get out of your comfort zone, build relationships with maybe somebody not like you and get to know them at a personal level. Have that conversation. There's a lot that you can learn about yourself um, and there's a lot I'm sure they can learn about you. And Mr. Allen, can you take us home? Absolutely. I would uh, encourage you to go to Thrive's website and check out the resources and share them with uh, folks in your community. Um, Get involved in your local communities, be it uh, with organizations like the NAACP, uh, local Black Lives Matter chapters, or any uh, active grassroots organizations that uh, you may you may have uh, close to you to see what's going on, uh, and uh, just uh, pay attention and, and be kind to your neighbor. Mr. Mr. Allen, Mr. Carney, Dr. Jones, Mr. Vincent, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a great second installment to our webinar series uh, from grassroots to government. And we really appreciate you. Again, it's going to be archived on YouTube uh, after 5.30 tomorrow uh, to give my colleague Glenn enough time to put it up and do any small edits he may have to do. And I encourage you to join us next week. We continue with uh, number three, Ad Hoc Committee on African-American Disparities. as uh, capturing the need for a new representative body charged with examining unique barriers faced by Greensboro's largest minority population. We have a, a, a great panel assembled for that, Crystal Black, uh, Josie Williams, uh, Dr. Jones is going to return to moderate as well as uh, City Councilwoman Sharon Hightower. So uh, that'll be next Tuesday. The, is that the 20th? Yeah, the 20th at 6 p.m. Uh, register. Go on our website or any one of the Greensboro History Museum social media platforms and you can register. Everything's free. Uh, but show up because like I always say, the bigger the number, the easier the argument it is for budgeting for next year. And so uh, I appreciate that. But uh, you guys have been great. Thank you. And uh, listen, I got me an intern coming who specializes in writing lesson plans. And uh, so we're going to get this out to you and get this into our, our, our school population. Good. Thanks so, for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. And you have a great evening. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Thank you, audience. Thank you very much.